Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my derivation of the Fourier transform. This is video number two of three and I'm going to discuss Fourier integrals. In the previous video to this, video number one of three, I did a, der or, excuse me, a revision of Fourier series. So in that I discussed the definition of Fourier series and how we derived the coefficients a sub n, b sub n and a sub zero. I also discussed the concept of basis functions, the cosines and sines, and the concept of the frequency domain. And finally also discussed the Fourier cosine and sine series, and that's something which will be very important towards the latter part of this particular video. Before I continue, I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed, and they may be of use to you there. Before we begin, I'd like to do a smaller vision of video number one of three, in terms of the frequency domain and basis functions. So we're well used to using the i hat, j hat and k hat vectors in order to describe the Cartesian space. But if you're using, if you're dealing with something which has spherical symmetry, it's often good to use the unit vectors r hat, theta hat, and phi hat. So these would be your basis vectors for your Cartesian space. Of course they are equivalent. Or if you want to have, if you have cylindrical symmetry, you might use r hat, theta hat, and z hat. The important point to note here is that all of these vectors are able to describe your space or be a basis for your space because they are orthogonal. And I showed in the last video that cosine and sine are orthogonal in a mathematical sense. This means that we can use cosine and sine as a basis for a space, but they are no longer vectors, they are functions. So we speak about them as being the basis functions for our space and that is only possible because they are orthogonal in a mathematical sense. Also we saw that because the argument of cosine and sine had to be dimensionless, we had to divide by something which had the inverse units of our function, in other words a frequency. So we, we saw that we were actually going from our time domain to our uh, temporal frequency domain, or from our spatial domain to our spatial frequency domain. And this is something which Fourier series introduced ever before the Fourier transform did. So let's move on. Fourier series describe periodic functions. Most functions, however, are aperiodic. So how do we make a link between periodic functions and aperiodic functions? We can consider the period going to infinity. And we could suggest that if the period goes to infinity, we have the link between a periodic and an aperiodic function. So let's just remind you what the Fourier series of a function looks like. So we have at the bottom of your screen f of t. So this is the Fourier series of f of t. Now because this is the periodic function f of t, I'm going to give it the subscript l. If there is no subscript l, that means you're talking about the aperiodic function of t. So this is going to be a0, or perhaps a0 over 2 depending on your definition. And then we're going to have the infinite sum of a sub n cos n pi t over l plus b sub n sine n pi t over l. Remember of course that we have particular integrals to perform in order to evaluate a sub 0, a sub n and b sub n. As I said a moment ago, if your function is, is a function of t, which is perhaps measured in seconds, then L must be measured in per second or hertz. So we're talking about a frequency. So we're going time to temporal frequency or space to spatial frequency, depending on what the variable of your initial function is. Now we're here to discuss Fourier integrals, which means we're trying to go from a sum to an integral. In order to do this, we need to look at the discrete component in our Fourier series. Well, the discrete component, of course, is omega, or is our frequency, 
because our frequency depends on the discrete variable n. So I'd like to remind you how that is the case. Let's go back up here and define n pi over l as our angular frequency. And if we do that, we are, we are able to make the following expression. So you have cosine and sine of omega t. And that, of course, can, that this should be omega sub n and k sub n. Now, the link between the angular frequency and the linear frequency is made through the expressions I've written here, which I'm not going to go through. But of course, you can fe feel free to do that if you require. So from now on, I'm no longer going to write n pi t over l. Instead, I'm just going to write omega sub n times t. Or if I'm using the dummy variable, it'll be omega sub n times r. And that's exactly what I've written in the middle of your screen here. Nothing new except the omega, is, omega sub n is being used. But as I said earlier on, a0, a sub n, and b sub n are themselves integrals. And I've just plugged in all the terms in the integrals here. And I know it's starting to get to look messy, but this is nothing new. This is just it all being put together. There are a few things which are of note here. First of all, we have a scaling term involving the period. Also note that look at the integrals that we have here. In this particular integral here, we are inter integrating with respect to dummy, the dummy variable r, which means we're integrating out the variable r, which means this whole integral is going to transform our function of r to one of omega. So we're talking about a transform already. Now, in order for us to go from the discrete Fourier series to Fourier integrals, like I said, we need to discuss the discrete component, which is, of course, omega. We saw earlier on that omega is n pi over l. So how do we work out the difference between two different omegas. Well, we have omega n plus one minus omega n is going to be equal to delta omega. And we see that this is equal to pi over L. Or another way of writing it is that delta omega over pi is one over L. And you might say, well, so what? What we're going to do now is look at the scaling terms, which I illustrated earlier on, and plug in for delta omega. If I do that, I get the following expression. It does look complicated, but it is no more complicated than any of the expressions we've had in the past. We've just substituted 1 over L for delta omega over pi where applicable. We still have, of course, these kind of transforming integrals here and here. They are still there. So there is a transform of some description occurring. We are integrating on minus L to L, which is, is, is the period. But the important point to note here is that we now have this delta omega. Now, I'm sure you've seen Riemann sums in the past, and I'm also sure that you'll see where this is going. So just like the definition or the derivation of the integrals from the Riemann sums, we look at the limit of delta omega as L goes to, zero, L goes to uh, infinity. So if we do this, we see that the summation is approximated by an integral, and it's very important to note that this integral has a lower limit of zero. And the periodic function f of t subscript L is now the aperiodic function f of t. Also, of course, the limits in these integrals are now minus to positive infinity. But that's in contrast with the in, with the with this particular limit here, which will have a lower limit of zero. So in our integrals, or in our two separate integrals, one of them will go from minus to positive infinity, and one will start at zero and go to infinity. Putting it all together so, we have this particular expression here on the top of your screen. And if we make the, the, these two definitions of a of omega and b of omega, 
we can rewrite it in the following term in the middle of your screen. We speak of having Fourier integrals. Now if you're wondering how come we're talking about, we'll say, b of omega instead of b of n, b sub n, well we're after going from the discrete variable n to the continuous variable omega, so of course that is natural for it to happen. I'd like to analyze for a moment this particular integral here, calculating a of omega. As I've said in the past, we are integrating out omega. So we're left, pardon me, there's a typo there. So I'm going to start that again. Let's look at the integral to calculate the coefficient a of omega. What's happening here is we're integrating out r and we're left with omega. So we're starting with a function of r, we're performing an integral on it where we are integrating out r and we are returning with a, a function of omega. So we're transforming from r to omega. Similarly here on the right side for b of omega, we're transforming from f of r to b of omega. So these integrals are performing a transform for us. It's also very important to note that we have still remained, or we've still kept, this scaling term 1 over pi. So I'm sure you can see that this is actually the scaling term in the Fourier transform. We'll be missing perhaps a 2 or a root 2 pi, whichever, depending on which version of the Fourier transform you're using. But we've now gone from discrete Fourier series to continuous Fourier integrals where the integrals calculating a of omega and b of omega stretch from minus to positive infinity whereas the outer integral stretches only from zero to infinity. Now in video one of three I discussed the Fourier cosine and sine series so if you want to know a bit more about that you should go backwards I'm not I'm just going to uh, assume you've seen that so where our function f of t is even, the b of omega term, or the odd terms, are going to be zero. And we'll only be left with a of omega and f of t in terms of a of omega. We're left with the Fourier cosine integral. Now I'm going to do a small bit of a sleight of hand. A moment ago I noted that the integral for a of omega and b of omega went from minus infinity to positive infinity. But we're integrating cosine, which is an even function, with respect to r anyway, in this particular integral here. Therefore, I'm able to actually integrate from zero to infinity and double it, so I get this extra two here. And the reason I'm doing it is I want some similarity between the two integrals I'm performing. What we're actually looking at here is a transform pair. And that's what this is here, it's a transform pair. There are actually, believe it or not, two transforms in here. And I've written them in the bottom of your screen as the forward and reverse cosine transform. So what I've done first of all is removed the dummy variable r in favor of the initial variable t. And I've called the function which is the result of this capital F of omega and we go from small f of t to capital F of omega. So we're transforming from f of t to capital F of omega. So we're going from the temporal frequency, temporal domain to the temporal frequency domain or the spatial domain to the spatial frequency domain. It's also important to note what I've done with this scaling term, the 2 over pi. Because we're dealing with a Fourier transform pair, I can put this scaling term anywhere I want, or even at the, the, anything that gives me the ratio of which would give me that scaling term. So I could put the entire 2 over pi on the forward transform, the reverse transform, or I could split it up. Here I have split it up. So let's look at the forward transform in a bit more detail. We're starting with our initial function f of t. So this here is the forward transform. So we input f of t 
we multiply it by cosine of omega times t and integrate it dt from 0 to infinity. We scale it by root 2 over pi and we get into the frequency domain and we have cosine as the basis function. The use of that of course is something I'm going to discuss in video number 3. So in order to go from the function in the frequency or Fourier domain we perform the inverse transform. So we input the capital F of omega multiplied by cosine of omega times t integrated d omega with the scaling term and we get back our original function. And that's why these are called Fourier pairs. So in this case this is the cosine transform or the Fourier cosine transform. A very similar argument can be performed for the cosine, excuse me, for the Fourier sine transform, where our initial input function f of t is an odd function, and therefore we're able to get our sine transform. Note, by the way, just for, I suppose, just for a bit of variety, I've put the entire two over pi or scaling term on the inverse transform. So that's all I've got to say in this particular video. In the next video, I'm going to discuss the complex Fourier integral and finally derive the Fourier transform. So thanks for watching, please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you might also give universityphysicstutorials.com a view. Thank you.